My name is William Cross. It's my lovely wife, Peggy. Hi. And we're here to talk about concrete pumping and the early days of pumping. From my recollection, my brother came home one day and said, I'm going to go and start a business. And I've looked into several things and one of them was sandblasting tank cars, but the workman's comp was so high that it discouraged me and I found this concrete pump which you know in those days when you talk to a superintendent on a job site and tell him you want to pump concrete he would say what how, how are you going to do that and they were lost as to the concept of pouring plastic concrete or concrete in its plastic state but anyway in the beginning my brother sold his hot rod he'd worked on and built and uh, scraped together what money he could and he bought this $14,000 Whiteman P40. A little gasoline engine on it and little four inch cylinders and was rated at 40 yards an hour. But uh, as time progressed I think the first year we had ended up buying about six machines in the first year. That's how fast we were growing. What year was that? And that was in 65, 66, in that era. And what was your brother's name? Charles. Charles Cross. His close friends called him Bud. That's the only thing I knew him by my whole life, was Bud. But he had a lot of friends and made a lot of friends everywhere he went. And in the early days, we didn't have boom trucks. There was no such thing as a boom truck. We pumped for probably four or five years before anybody even come up with a boom truck. And in them days, the first boom trucks were like the Thompson six, 640s with the manually put the boom together and it would go up and down and right and left, but it wouldn't articulate or, or come back towards itself. So, I'm bit, but it was a big advantage for pouring something up on a deck to get up there, but it just took forever to bolt and pin everything together for that four inch boom to go up there. And concrete people didn't know much about mixed designs. They really, they really didn't because when they ordered concrete, a lot of times you, the gap grating would prevent you from pumping it. It would plug up and oh, the misery went through with cleaning out and when they'd send a load of slag that wasn't soaked. And those were the days you get that that big heavy bell you take off the back of a Thompson, it would fall on your feet. <laughs> You'd be all bruised from buckling it up. But, you know, we came a long way. And Whiteman came along with this, their better line, the P80s and the P100s. And they were beginning to develop a boom truck. And about the time Whiteman got strong with boom trucks, and, and even their booms was, they would unfold and you would only have like uh, one articulating section. And they graduated to aluminum booms, which would give them out 100 foot. And as they were still with that one unfold and then you had a, s a simple tip section articulation. And that was, they were king of the hill when Schwing hit the streets. When Schwing come to this country, we were the very first people that bought a Schwing. We bought, uh, we went to Germany, to the factory. I was quite impressed with Schwing. But while we're at the factory talking to them about buying a concrete pump, out front of the factory they're craning bucketing concrete into the foundations of the Schwing building. But uh, we made several trips to Schwing in Germany. And one of them we run into Steve Marley out there. He was buying this was years later, he was buying some 42s and mounting them on American trucks, which up to that point we only could get them on Mercedes and Magaris and, you know, German trucks. And the Germans are very smart people. They had some really good machinery. That's really what kicked the button up in the pumping industry. Whiteman had good machines, but there were so many moving parts that we'd work all day pumping concrete and work all night working on the machines that were broken. Is a, you know, the moving parts, too many moving parts. And I think that uh, 
although they did a good job, they were just too high maintenance. That's what kicked their butt. What are some of the older pumps that you, you guys own? Well, we own owned some old Whitemans. We had some Thompsons. We had uh, we had purchased a company that had three, a ready mix company that had three or four Thompson booms, early models, the 740 and the 747, which had the swing open five inch uh, boom. And uh, later models were like the 2001 and the 875. And, but they had the flapper valve. And the valving in it was a flapper back and forth. And at the time, Pootsmeister was developing a machine and the Pootsmeister had a flapper too, but it was sideways. It would flop this way instead of this way. And at the time, they didn't use hydraulic oil to, for the pumping process. They would pump high pressure water into the, into the pistons is what they moved, and that was the early Putzmeisters. But we went to a Con Ag show when we first found the Schwings in Chicago. You remember what year? Oh boy, it had to be about 60, 66, 60, around, right around 66, 67. And uh, Schwing had a, a couple machines in there. One of them was a trailer pump that we were very fascinated about because you could plug the, the, the pull hitch in the front and you could take it off and you could plug it in the back and pull it from the hopper hmm. the down the road. It was, their thinking was just far beyond what we could fathom at the time. And they also had the booms had stiff legs on them where the first section would open up and then the next two sections would articulate but always the main section would stand straight up. They called it a stiff leg. And we had several of them uh, over the years that uh, at the end of this, you'd have a 36 meter boom. That was the 45. That was the biggest machine we had at the time was a 45 meter. It was on a Magaris truck. In order to pull the clutch out, you had to pull the engine out. It was just all built from the center out you know, the, the hydraulic pumps and then the transfer cases and on up to the engine. And if you had a clutch that went bad, you had to pull the engine, you know, do things just, just the way they were made. But that machine was called Big Duke. And uh, in fact, we had it down here for a while. Our, uh, a guy named Richard Kilroy run it for us out of Chicago. But, um, we bought the first 42s in, the, we bought the first Schwings in the country. Then we, we bought the first of everything Schwing came out with for about 15 years. The very first machines they came out with, with the, they were making a 26 slash 28, which had a jib that pulled out on the end of the boom, went from a 26 to a 28. And then they went to the, the fixed 28, which is still used today. And then uh, they come out with a 31 meter, which was a little bit longer boom. Outriggers were swing out outriggers. And they, they discontinued that, oh, about 10 years ago, I think it was, 10, 15 years ago. The 31s that you know now have a telescoping boom on them and you know they call them the EZ. But anyway, uh, we bought all the latest the Schwing booms as they came out. We bought the first ones up until we couldn't afford to do it any longer, which was probably in the 80s, probably around 82 or something like that. We were, I remember one time we were at World of Concrete and we had bought a, I had bought some 28 meters, 1,028s on Freightliner trucks and those two machines cost $740,000 and interest rates was 24%. It was just killer. The, the interest was, was eating you up. But those were the times. And we had a, we had a large Schwing fleet before the turndown came in uh, 09, 08, 09. And we probably sold about uh, two thirds of our machinery 
when the banks put the thumb on you to say dispose of these assets yeah. we want our money so back in the early days um, how well was Schwing in the American market oh Schwing was king in fact we even went from Detroit Michigan to uh, Palo Verdes in California to do a demo for uh, Duane Perrin at the time at the nuclear power plant there. American concrete For plant? American concrete. Were you guys a Schwing dealer at that time? We were the, we weren't the very first, we were about the second dealer they had. Well those were the days Dennis Andrews worked with us and he went off to start his own business in Washington. Who, who, who has worked for you that's, you know, Oh, Grady Stallings worked for us mm -hmm. for a long time. He went down to run the Carolina operation we had started, and he moved on to Schwing and doing his own business, and you know a million things that Grady was involved with. I guess his kids in the business in Atlanta now. Mm -hmm. But uh, let's see who else. Lisa Polanski worked for us. Tinko worked for us for a while. Dave. Mm hmm. Good man. And, uh, gosh, I know a lot of operators that uh, back in the days where we had gate valve machines, you could teach them how to keep a machine clean. The rest of the stuff kind of fell together. How about uh, what, what year did you become a Schwing dealer? Do you remember? Oh, this was early on. We were, oh, this would have been the late 60s. Like 68, 69? I, I, I think about 69 we mm -hmm. were, were swing distributor. And we had bought a bunch of corn binders, they called them, internationals, with their 28 meter booms on them. And we had some Fords. I remember walking through your uh, Detroit office mm -hmm. a few years back and I think you guys had parts from the 60s oh yeah we had there. a chain pump out on outside it was our it was our monument or our like that electric placing boom across the street yeah it was uh, huge that thing was as big as this room mm -hmm. and the, the ready mix trucks had to build ramps up to unload into it it was a mechanical chain pump is that like the pump crete? Yeah, exactly. The same thing? The exactly. pump crete was exactly. like, like that, Yeah, right? exactly, a pump crete. Yeah. Uh, in yeah. fact, I think that's what it was called, was I pump crete. I think they were pump cretes, yeah. Yeah, pump crete. They had a chain drive. Uh, they had singles and doubles, one cylinder or two cylinders. Back in the early days, we had aluminum pipe. And you could take five ten-footers and put it on this shoulder, and five ten-footers on this shoulder, you could carry a hundred feet of pipe. Well, <laughs> one man. The Cross Brothers could do yeah. that, right? Because you well, guys were like we were strapping. <laughs> yeah, but there was aluminum pipe too. They were very light. Yeah, and we used Victolic couplings, and boy, those were Victolic couplings on aluminum pipe was a great training device because you get any kind of a plug or resistance, or the guy would kink the hose, and boom, one of your clamps would blow apart. And you'd have to get the, the uh, come along out, and jack it back together, and put new clamps on it. If they were adjustable, make sure they're as tight as you can get them because those grooves would wear where the clamp would, the pipe would jump right out of the clamp. So it's a groove in the pipe. The groove in it's the not pipe. It's a high rise on it the It didn't pipe. have a, the raised ring was one of the greatest inventions to the pump industry yeah. when they started putting that raised ring around the outside of the pipeline because then they would hold together under pressure. I can remember on a turbine pedestal, a power plant one time, we were pumping, we had an old Case Macar uh, pump, and it would just seem like the mixes were so out of control. But you get a rough mix and bang, it'd blow the whole back end apart. But to pull that thing back together with chain falls and come alongs and reclamp it and, oh, it was a nightmare we have come a long way i think the raised ring was one of the greatest inventions 
that come along for concrete pumps. Who, who, who brought up that raise? Right? You know, I don't know. I know Conform started showing up with them, with their, with the, but their dimensions were a little bit bigger with the Conform's raised ring than with the uh, Schwing, what we call a Schwing coupling. And they still are. Uh, auto, auto greasers was another great step forward with pumping concrete because you couldn't put enough grease in their babies. And when you have a machine to do it for you, it just revolutionized things. Yeah, so let's talk about some of the, the revolutions that you've seen throughout the years from when you started to now. Like, are boom parties much easier today than they were back in the 60s? I think we had more boom parties back there. I, I think mostly because the mixes weren't controlled as well. You know, nowadays, you order concrete and we emphasize to the guy we're working for, tell them you're pumping the concrete. It puts the burden of proof on them to come to the job site with a pumpable mix. Because if he's out there trying to clean up his yard and he, he rakes all this footer mud in there, got big stones, little stones, nothing in between, you know, lean on cement. There were so many factors that come into play, porosity of the, of the coarse aggregate, porosity of the fine aggregate. It's just so many obstacles to overcome. Now you order a pumpable mix, the ready mix guy knows what you want. He puts enough cement in it, you know, makes a big difference. Yeah. We've come a long way, the industry did. So off the top of your head, from when you started, on um, what are the advancements that really helped companies oh manage? i can't tell you how much time we used to spend on repairing remote cords you know i'd like to say well a forklift ran over it but mm -hmm. that ain't the case it was probably left dangling over the outrigger when they closed it cut them wires you know or just regular wear and tear maintaining remote cords was a major finger in the eye you know, to have do away with that. I never would have dreamed that cordless remotes would be so reliable and so fault free as they are. They come a long way. That was a big. Was there a big resistance to remotes at first when they started? I think at first out? because of the cost. Everybody's always concerned about how much things cost. So, you know, there was that natural resistance to not spend a lot of money on them, but they were well worth it. Yeah, that was a great advancement. Auto greasers, cordless remotes, raised ring clamps. Well, uh, I don't know about aluminum pipe. I'm still, they claimed at the time aluminum couldn't be used because it, the contact with the concrete produced an oxide gas, which caused a weakening of the concrete. Now, I know they blamed a lot of things on that. Any failures of concrete right away, oh, you used aluminum pipe. That, not my problem, it's your problem. But I really think there's other things, finishing machines and stuff that come in contact with concrete that are made out of aluminum. And truck chutes, I think some of them are made out of aluminum. So I don't know that that all holds water about the aluminum contact. But it would be a great thing because the weight of them pipes was a different day. When you could hold an arm load and over your shoulder and climb up a small building with them and... How did they wear? Well, they wear, they wore, they took the wear pretty good, but they were soft. You know, the, where the, the clamping, the movement of the clamp would cause wear on the groove and they would blow apart. Plus your clamps get loose and, you know, they're not as tight, they'll blow loose, but... But we killed two birds with one stone there. Raised ring. Yeah, how's that, the evolution of the valving on oh, the tube? How's that well, technology coming? You know, in the early days, we thought we were King Kong with the spade valves on those showings. Whiteman had a spade valve that, that closed like this. And uh, Schwing came along with a flat blade with a rod on it. But uh, you had pot oil to contend with. You know, you had to examine your pot oil after so many yards and, and and definitely at the end of the day dump it out, put fresh oil in the next day. 
and you had rod seals that needed to be, if you found any rubber in the pots, you had to change the seals. And, uh, if you, or if you got grout in it. What was the next evolution past that? The next evolution, the great evolution, was the rock valve, Schwing's rock valve. And I know the S tube that, well, Putzmeister had the elephant trunk first. And he did a job, hell, they're still in business, so it wasn't completely a, a train wreck. But Friedrich Schwing once told me in person that that weakness with the S tube was that it wouldn't handle the torque under pressure in the pipeline would cause it to be distorted where it made contact with the pressure plate and they would have extreme problems with that but you know he had to be a little bit wrong on it because they're still there mm -hmm. they still pump a lot of concrete and all of the Korean pumps all make this Putzmeister look alike S tube you know, I don't know who holds the patent on it, if anybody does, but it certainly wasn't that bad of a mistake because they're still working, they're still using them. And they had the Sidewinder was made the same way. The little Australian pump from Ian Hay. Nice guy. Yeah, nice guy. Is he still around? Yeah. He's still kicking. He's still yeah. in the industry. Yeah. Hmm. I think he sold that out to somebody. The American division, I think, maybe. Yeah, he's still involved. I still Ian talk Hay, yeah. Yeah. He was like Todd Bullis. He was a young kid when I met him. <laughs> he's probably retired now. Huh? Yeah, he's one of the older guys, but yeah. he's one of the guys that knows everything about mm -hmm. everybody, you know, in yep. the beginning. I want to tell you a little story about a job. This was in 1973, 72, 73. We had an opportunity. We were called in to look at a project in downtown Detroit. It was a 70-story hotel with four 40 story buildings on the outside of them, six 18 story buildings alongside them and on the riverfront. And the people who were awarded the contract were out of Chicago, Mayfair Construction. And they wanted to talk to us about pumping and what we knew about it. And we spent a day down there convincing them that we knew what to do and we could do it and blah, blah, blah and they weren't quite convinced I think we, because we were so young we all looked so young it's hard to believe that was only a, about 40 years ago 50 years ago <laughs> <laughs> but anyway so we we made contact with a guy named Fran Wilson from Milwaukee who's been floating in and out of this of the industry for a while he was a much older gentleman well educated spoke eloquently and uh, he just had a way with words and he was an engineer of course he slept in his car he might have drank a little too much every day but he was older he come across with this with the right demeanor we had him go with us in here and Fran was our spokesperson and he really did push it over the top and we all felt it was because he was an older guy they weren't listening to us young kids you know they were listening to him and that and uh, he more or less helped sell the job where we had a world's record pumping 546 feet which was one of the 40 story buildings on the outside and how we accomplished that we couldn't convince them that we could pump to the top of that building they were still leery about doing it so we made a compromise with them we agreed to pump halfway and then pump into another machine that we skid mounted and slid in on the floor. It was a Whiteman P80. We slid it in on, on one of the 20th floors. We pumped into it and then from it on up the next 20 some floors and everything went well. In fact, it went so well that we, we said, we feel confident we can pour one machine all the way. So on the second building or second or third building, I think it was the second building, they let us try it to see how far we could go. And we went to the roof, and that's where we had the world's record. And we held that record for, oh, 30 days or so. <laughs> what year was that? That was in 75. And what was the name of that building? And that was the Renaissance Center. Renaissance Center. Still standing. Still oh. standing there. 
They're talking it's about it falling G off. GMC now, right? Yeah, it was a Ford built yeah. the building, and after it was built, they they sold the property to mm -hmm. General Motors. Mm -hmm. But nice. that was really something that we could go from twenty stories to forty stories. We only had that record for a short time, and Dwayne Perrin broke it at Century City in Los Angeles. He went just a few feet higher than we did. So we had to acknowledge he had the record. But he didn't have it long either, and George Brock in Houston had, uh, uh, what was the name of that city, what was the name of the job? But he went several hundred feet further. And then he had a record for a little bit longer, and then a guy in Toronto went like 2,000 feet on that Space Needle. So. See what you started? Yeah, you start something like that, it gets out of hand. <laughs> Everybody's doing it. <laughs> but I never would have imagined that pumping concrete would become so popular and so widespread. I see online different, I watch little pumpers, well, little pumpers, I'm talking about people that have one or two trailer pumps. And they, Southern California, they, they work together and they, you know, it's amazing what a network it has created between pumpers, especially the P-Rock pumpers. It seems like they work together, they do great things. Of course, you always have a couple of, you know, guys that want to be rebels and, you know, I'm Mr. Concrete and call me the best because that's what I think. And But overall, this industry is quite amazing how long, how far it's came, what it's accomplished and all the new things New people, new places. So the latest valve would be, and the best valve in your opinion? I don't know, I'll tell you the truth. When when Schwing's built the rock valve, they're now doing several variations to it, okay. but it's still the same basic engineering. When they, was it in about 1985, 84, 85 that they come out with this? and they, they went from the gate valve to the rock valve and they're still using it, same technology. So they must have a corner on it until somebody comes along with a tin can of two strings and <laughs> it starts talking. Yeah. Somebody will come along with something different, something better. What about, uh, do you have any stories about Friedrich Schwing? Oh yeah, Friedrich was kind of reserved, quiet. Gerhardt was always the guy that was anxious to tell you a story or, you know, they were both a couple of characters. So did you and your brother, uh, Charlie, worked together or was it, were you guys? My brother started this pumping business and I was still working, I was an electrician in a auto plant. I worked for Chrysler engine plant and I went to their assembly plant and then their, their axle plant and yeah, I worked all over for Chrysler, but I worked part-time with my brother, pumping concrete. And it got to the point where he said, we're just busy, you need to full-time it. And I did. And I worked for him probably 10 years. It was in the 90s when he said, I'm gonna make you a partner. So he made me a partner of things. And, and I, of course, I was on the road quite a bit we opened an operation in in Baltimore, Maryland. Went to Frederick, Maryland, Washington, D.C. And uh, oh, there was a oh Washington, D.C., Frederick, Maryland, and Baltimore. I think it was. There was a triangle that we, seventy mile triangle that we was pumping concrete in. And at the time, they were building the subway tracks in into Washington, and then had uh, about seven or eight partners in the business that we did out there. Yeah, Grady was one, Joe Delacqua, Dennis Andrews. Um, Peggy. Yes. So, uh, how have you been able to, to manage these guys over the years? Well, I only came into this business, Bill and I met in 1984, so. But uh, my background is, youth, is utilities, um, even though I would assist in helping to answer the phone and things at home at night. But 
I really did not come into this industry until about 2003. Um, I had retired uh, from the utility company and then decided I'd come in and check and see what this was about. And <laughs> I was going to work maybe two weeks to fill in for someone. Um, you know, and here it is. I think you find that true that most yeah. concrete spouses are exposed to the workings mm -hmm. of the, uh, at least the administrative part of pumping. Yeah. And the next thing you know, they're running it. Yeah. So. She, she worked herself right into a job. Yeah, I did. I came in to work two weeks and then that person was decided not to come back and so I said okay I'll give this a try and see. I'm a bit bossy, most people know that, so I like to I like change, I like to see new things come into the industry. So to me it was not much difference between seeing what you do with the utility business and what you do with the pumping business. You know, it's pretty much managing people, managing jobs managing how the information comes in and goes out.